Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Sharples here is going to talk about the tides and the oceanography of our neighbouring seas. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, I often start with the, the, the sort of public talks that I give. I always put the video of the ship in the, in the heavy sea at the front, just to, just to see how many green places there are in the <laughs> um, once we get started. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, the tides and the oceanography. What, what I want to do is talk about two particular aspects of the uh, tide. Uh, one is why the UK tide's so big, and that's kind of, it's sort of been alluded to a few times in the last... Uh, last um, uh, three talks, but I, I want to try and give you some sort of intuitive sense about why tides, say, in the Irish Sea are particularly big. Uh, and the second one I want to talk about is something that I'm fairly sure, if you're not an oceanographer, you will have thought about these. It's these sort of weird underwater tidal waves that we get. And in both instances, I want to show how the physics of it uh, ends up having a really, really important consequence for the biology of the seas around the UK. So, the first one, why the tide's so big? So, we've heard of apparently grumpy uh, Isaac Newton. Uh, he predicted, it, it, the fantastic thing Isaac Newton did was come up with calculus. Uh, there's a bit of a debate about whether it was Newton or Leibniz who, who came up with it, and ultimately what we use is a mixture of the two anyway. But once you have the calculus, you can do a whole range of things, um, uh, work out a whole range of things. And he worked out, one of the things he worked out was an estimate, probably the first estimate, of what's the range of the of the tide, the dis distance between high water and low water. And he came out with a, a, a figure of a metre. If you're out in the middle of the Atlantic, that's about right. And so the tidal range in the middle of the Atlantic is, is roughly uh, a metre. But, as we've heard, the tidal range in Liverpool is more like nine or ten metres. So how do we get that? What is it that happens that allows you to take that one metre predicted range of the tide in the open ocean and end up with nine or ten metres um, in Liverpool. So, and this is something that um, uh, David talks about, the tide is not generated locally. So the tide is generated way out here, down in the northeast uh, Atlantic, and it moves as a wave onto the shelf. So all this is, this, the colours here are the depth of the ocean, uh, and the blue is sort of depths of 100 to 200 metres. That's the continental shelf. So you can see the deep ocean here, about four kilometres deep. You suddenly move on to the continental shelf, which is relatively shallow water uh, all the way up to the coast. So that's the tidal wave moving from the deep ocean, where it's generated, <laughs> across onto the shelf and up into the Irish Sea. So there are two things that we need to look at to try and understand why the tide is so big. The first one is what happens to this tidal wave as it crosses from a depth of four kilometres to a depth of 100, uh, 200 metres. And then the second one is to think, what happens when the tide moves into somewhere like the Irish Sea? And I refer to the Irish Sea as a semi-enclosed sea. It's a bit like a bathtub with one end uh, taken off. The North Channel here is very narrow. The tidal wave doesn't see that. The tide just bounces off the North Channel and comes back out uh, through the Irish Sea again. So what happens when the tide crosses into the really shallow water on the shelf? And what happens when it starts bouncing around inside a semi-enclosed or the water like the Irish Sea. So the first bit, you can see yourself. If you go down to a, a beach, admittedly it's quite difficult to see the kind of beaches we have around here because the, 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 the gradients of them are so, uh, so uh, low. But when you look at waves approaching a beach, what you, what you notice is that the waves get bigger as the, as, as the, as the wave gets closer, closer, to the, um, closer to the shore, closer to the beach. And the reason for that is, as the wave gets into shallow water, friction with the seabed slows the wave down. And there's a fundamental principle in physics that that wave has to uh, meet, and that is conservation of energy. It can't lose uh, energy. So the physicist in the audience, okay, to a first approximation, it can't lose uh, energy. The energy of the wave is partially to do with how fast it's moving, but also to do with how big it is. So if you start to slow the wave down in shallow water, it has to get bigger to conserve energy. So that's why waves get bigger as they move into shallower water. Ultimately, it's why we have uh, breaking surf against uh, um, uh, beaches. So this is um, the trace from an echo sounder from a, a research vessel as we were moving from the Celtic Sea, uh, water depths of sort of getting down to about 200 meters just at this point here and then you drop off down into the deep ocean. So this just keeps on going down to about four kilometers uh, depth. It looks like you've gone over a cliff 
But actually, what you've got to realize is we're going from about 200 meters down to about four kilometers depth here, but over a horizontal distance of about 40 or 50 kilometers. So it's actually not that, uh, not that steep. It's just an awful lot steeper than uh, on the shelf. So the tidal wave is out here in the deep ocean in about four kilometers of water, crosses into this shallower water, and it suddenly goes from four kilometers to 200 meters, it significantly slows the wave down, so the wave has to get bigger. And it gets bigger by about a factor of two. So that's okay, we've got partially towards the size of the, uh, uh, the waves that we have um, in the Irish Sea. We've gone from one meter in the deep ocean to about two meter tidal range uh, once you get onto this relatively shallow water uh, on the um, shelf. Now, the bit that has been skirted around in the last couple of talks, so Judith talked about resonance and quarter wave resonance. I want to try and give you some sort of intuitive sense about why, about what happens when the tide then moves into the Irish, uh, into the Irish Sea. Oh, come on, Chris, what was this called, Newton's? I heard you gave me the name for it once a few, a few months ago. All, all it is is a, sort of knocked up in the, in, the, in the cellar at home. A piece of string stretched uh, between those two pieces of wood. We have a very heavy pendulum here, so that's going to be our tidal forcing. Think of that as a tidal wave coming in from the Atlantic. And then a series of pendulums of different lengths um, strung from that <coughs> string. So that. So that's our tide oscillating backwards and forwards, and that's pushing sea level up and down at the entrance to the uh, Irish Sea. And this pendulum is our Irish Sea. If the shape of the basin, the shape of the semi-enclosed sea is just right, and for the sea that means it has to have the right length and the right depth, then it will resonate to the force of the tide pushing water in every 12, um, uh, 12, and, a half, um, 12 and a half hours. I'm sure you all have some experience of doing this yourself. Imagine, I mean, for some of us, it's a little bit longer ago than, 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 than others, but a, a, a swing in a playground. The way that when you're trying to get the swing to go higher and higher, you have to swing your legs, and you have to swing your legs at just the right speed in order to keep feeding energy into your <coughs> swing. So yeah, just going back to this um, this demonstration, actually one advantage of having that little break there is that Joe told me it's called Barton's Pendulum. That's the name of the, that name of the experiment. And what you could see was that, just going back and repeating it a little bit, one of those pendulums responds, that's the one that has the same length. It's the one that has the same um, period of oscillation, frequency of oscillation, as the, as the driving force. It responds really, really strongly. And I think as I was talking about the sitting on the swing in the playground, uh, all right, but the idea that you have to use your legs to force it at just the right frequency and you get a really big response uh, in, the, um, uh, in the swing, in the amplitude of the swing. So that's why the tides are so big in the Irish Sea. The Irish Sea is not quite perfect, but it's very close to that condition where it will respond very strongly to the forcing of this 12 and a half hour uh, tidal wave hitting the entrance of the, um, uh, of the Irish Sea. Now, I'll talk about a consequence of these big tides now. Uh, again, this is something that um, David talked about. If, you're, if you've got a tidal range of nine meters, that's a lot of water. You think of Liverpool Bay, in fact, I think it's about high tide now. Uh, over the next five or six hours, you will move about one meter further away from the center of the earth. Because there is so much high tide, there is so much water in Liverpool Bay, it pushes the land down slightly. I think Mr. John Simpson told me this years ago. I'm fairly sure I got it right. Um, but as the tide goes out, then the land comes back up again. To move that amount of water into and out of the Irish Sea or Liverpool Bay 
over the few hours that you've got in the tide means you have to have currents that are, that are pretty strong. So the left-hand panel here just the, is showing you the strength of the, the tidal currents. The, the red is two meters per second, or about four, um, four knots. Uh, what's really nice there, you can see that, the deep ocean shelf, you can see that sudden change in the strength of the tides because of that factor two increase you get in the strength of the tides as they move from the deep water uh, into, the, uh, into the shallow water. Then you can see these really strong tides you get in the uh, Irish Sea, sort of one and a half uh, meters per second, about three knots. So it's not the currents I want to talk about, it's the stress, it's the friction that those currents feel as they're moving backwards and forwards against the, uh, against the seabed. And this is a calculation I get the students to do um, in, the, in the second year. There's a fairly straightforward formula you can use. If you know what the speed of the current is, you can calculate the force that's been exerted by that current uh, against, the, uh, against the seabed. And so that's what's in the right-hand panel here. So what you can see is up here in the Irish Sea, where we've got the strong tides, you get this force of typically 5 newtons per square metre. In almost force, 5 newtons per square metre. But you've got no sense of what that actually feels like. What does 5 newtons per square metre look like? So what I get the students to do then is there's another, a very similar formula, just a few constants are different in it, that you can calculate what's the force that you would experience walking around on a windy day. <coughs> and you can use those two formulas with each other to calculate what wind would you have to experience walking around on land to feel the same force as the seabed of the Irish Sea does with these really strong um, tidal currents. And it turns out it's about 200 kilometers an hour. Really, really, so think of that, that 200 kilometers an hour, that's a pretty hefty um, hurricane. And that occurs twice, four times every day, ebb tide and flood tide twice every day. So down at the seabed of the Irish Sea, you experience four hurricanes um, every day. And the example I'll just talk about briefly here is, is this little creature here, Nephrops norvegicus, uh, Dublin Bay prawn, or, or a scampi, uh, effectively. So the, the total length of that uh, little animal is maybe 10, 15, uh, 15 centimetres. So this animal lives on the seabed in the Irish Sea. It has to cope with life every day for hurricanes. And it, it lives by, it sort of, mucks around on the seabed looking for stuff to eat, but it also digs burrows uh, into the seabed. And during springtime, those really strong tides that, that you've heard so much about, it stays in the burrows. The tide, the, the hurricane outside is just too strong. During neat tides, it's not quite as strong, and that's, that's when you see it on the, on the surface and feeding. And actually, if you go right the way to the other end of the food chain and look at the fishing vessels, fishing vessels going for this creature have a very strong spring neat cycle to their activity, because obviously they can only fish for these things at neat tides when they're out on the sediments. At spring tides, they're all hiding in their, uh, hiding in their burrows. So, that was the first thing. Was why tides are so big, and, and just a, a, a fairly straightforward example of why it has a, a, a consequence, or an important consequence on the, on the biology. And now we're going to talk about these underwater tidal waves. What you have to think about here, to start off with, is the ocean is layered. But the surface of the ocean, the water has lower density than it has, it has deeper down. Um, the obvious reason for that, particularly in our sort of relatively shallow seas, is that up near the surface, that's where the sunlight is. The, the sunlight warms the ocean surface. If you warm water, it expands and becomes less dense. And the sunlight doesn't get very deep, so that water down below stays very cold. So you've got two, think of two different layers of water. Warm, less dense water on the top, and cold, high density water uh, underneath. This is what I've sort of made in this tank um, here. Uh, as will become apparent shortly, the video is upside down, but I've, done, I've, put, I've put it upside down for, for a reason. So what I want you to imagine is at the top of this tank here, this is just a tank of water, it's about a metre long, imagine that's warm, low density water on the top, and the water down here is that high density cold water. And the red dye, the red food colouring there, is just sitting in that interface between those two layers, uh, those two layers of water. What I want to show you is what happens. Imagine you've got that water that's got these layers, and it's being pushed backwards and forwards by the tide. But it's being pushed over a bump uh, in the um, in the seabed. Oops. <coughs> 
Okay, here comes the bump in the seabed. That was my lab assistant just walking past there. Okay, so I'm moving this, this cylinder backwards and forwards in the tank. And what I really want you to pick out here is how that dense, uh, the layer of red water gets dragged down behind that cylinder as it's moved backwards and forwards. And you can see how these waves are developing on that, that interface between the, two layers, uh, between the two layers of water. As it goes on, what you can also see, which is going to be relevant uh, in, a, in a couple of slides' time, um, you get these tendrils of this red water being mixed down into that, uh, that deeper layer, and similarly water being mixed upwards uh, into the surface. So that's going to be a really important consequence uh, of, uh, of these, um, these waves. So you get any, any flow, any stratified <coughs> water flowing over a bump uh, will generate these waves. And thinking of it going backwards and forwards like that, think of the tide going backwards and forwards over a bump uh, in the seabed. Now, the bump in the seabed I'm particularly interested in here is the edge of the continental shelf. So think, think about the, uh, the echo sounder trace uh, that I had uh, earlier, except I've done it the other way around here. So think of, of the sort of Irish and Celtic sea on this side, the edge of the continental shelf here, so that's a water depth of about 200 metres, and then dropping down to four kilometres or so in the, uh, in the Atlantic. And this is our warm layer of water on the top, cold water uh, underneath, and that interface, the thermocline, uh, is, is, is where that red water was in the, um, in the tank. So, take the continental shelf. Well, actually, what I did in the tank experiment was take the continental shelf and move it. Here, we've got the tide. So imagine the tide is ebbing and flowing off the continental shelf and down into the deep ocean. As it does that, as you saw in the, the demonstration, it pulls that thermocline down. It pulls that layer of what was in the tank experiment, red water, um, down. As long as the tide is flowing fast off, down off the shelf edge, it's going to pull the thermocline down. But of course, the tide doesn't stay like that all the time. It then starts to slow down and reverse. And as it slows down, it releases the thermocline. It's a bit like getting hold of a guitar string and pulling it down and then letting go. When you let go, it rings. It sends waves propagating backwards and forwards through the string uh, and, and making the sound. That's what happens here. You let go, you switch the tides off, this depression in the thermocline bounces back, and you get waves moving in both directions. One wave moving onto the shelf, and one wave moving off into the, uh, into the deep ocean. The wave moving onto the shelf is what we're interested in. These waves can be quite big. So the, to the total water depth there is about 200 meters. These waves can have a peak to trough range of about 100 meters, so half of the, uh, half of the water column. And it moves very slowly, typically sort of half to one meter per second, onto the shallow water on the shelf. Go back to thinking about the beach analogy again. When you see a big wave moving up onto the beach, eventually it breaks. Well, the reason it's doing that is that the trough of the wave gets slowed down by the friction, and the crest of the wave just catches up and falls over, and that's, that's the wave breaking. This internal wave does exactly the same thing. This internal tidal wave moves into the shallow water, the, the trough of it starts to be slowed down because the water suddenly got shallow and the seabed friction is slowing it down, and the wave breaks. And it breaks into a series of, of much smaller waves. The, the, the wavelengths of these are sort of typically one to two uh, kilometers. And the important thing about these waves is they generate a lot of turbulence. So think about seeing those, that bit of red water being mixed between the, uh, that layer in the tank and the surface of the bottom water. That's what happens here. These waves generate lots of turbulence, and they mix stuff between the two layers uh, of the water. Uh, the picture here was just uh, when we were out doing some work on this a few years ago. This is just a photograph taken straight off the ship's uh, radar. I get the, uh, the, the bridge officer to turn the, the noise up on the radar screen. So you, get, you start to see these bands. Of, it's what is called clutter in the radar uh, image. Those bands are changes in the roughness of the sea surface, which are caused by a packet of these waves moving past the... Uh, uh, past the ship. What becomes relevant later on as well, these three targets here are fishing vessels. Lots and lots of fishing vessels around the shelf edge, and that's where I'm heading to in terms of this, um, <coughs> this consequence. <coughs> now this is, actually this, this video was taken off the, uh, it was some work we were doing on the James Clark Ross, which is a forerunner to the David Attenborough that's currently being built uh, just across the, uh, across the water from us. 
So this is the kind of thing we do when we're trying to study the biological and chemical and physical consequences of these waves. Uh, this is a, a package of instruments here. Sat in the bottom of this frame is a whole range of instruments which measure things like the pressure of the water, the salt concentration, uh, the temperature, uh, and also the chlorophyll concentration, which, are, which will become uh, clear why later. It's collecting that data something like 25 times a second and sending it straight up the cable. The cable, the other end of the cable, eventually is inside the lab on the, on the ship, and so we can watch the data as it's lowered slowly down through the water, um, um, telling us about the, the, the layering of the ocean um, as we go from the warm water at the top to the colder water uh, underneath. These sort of grey tubes that you can see around the, uh, around the frame are sample bottles. So they, they've got two end caps which are connected through the middle of the bottle by, effectively by a bungee cord, and they're held open so that the water flows through the, through the middle of it as the thing is lowered down through the, uh, down through the water. The colour of the water here is not the Irish Sea. This is in the subtropical, um, <laughs> subtropical northeast Atlantic, which is a little bit, a little bit different. So you can see this thing then is lowered typically sort of about a metre per second, something like that. This one was being lowered down to a depth of um, five kilometres. So it's going to do a return trip of 10 kilometres. That's a lot of cable. Continuously sending data up to, the, um, uh, up to the ship. So we're watching the data being collected on the way down. When it's coming back up again, we then stop the package at certain depths and trigger one of those bottles. It's the 20 litre bottles. We trigger one of those bottles to shut then when the whole thing comes back on that deck later, we can collect the water from the bottles and, and work out things like um, not just the temperature and the salt, but things like what was living in the water, uh, how much nutrients there are in the water, and, and, and that sort of thing. So that's the kind of thing that we use when we go out and collect the um, data. Now, I said we were interested in measuring chlorophyll. So everybody knows chlorophyll, I guess, that, that green pigment that plants use to photosynthesize of the total amount of photosynthesis that occurs on the planet, half of it occurs on land, with trees and rainforests and grass and that sort of stuff, and half of it occurs in the ocean. The bit that occurs in the ocean is not, it's not seaweed and that sort of stuff. That's, that's not actually terribly important in terms of the total amount of photosynthesis. The photosynthesis in the deep ocean is being done by things that look like this. And these are really tiny. They're single-celled, microscopic, plants. <coughs> so they are plants, they, they operate in the same way as any other plant, they require sunlight to photosynthesize, uh, they quite require things like nitrate and phosphate uh, nutrients in order to grow, but they, they, they live in the ocean, they carry out a huge amount of photosynthesis um, in the ocean, up near the surface, because up near the surface is where the sunlight is. So we're interested in measuring chlorophyll, because these things have chlorophyll in order to photosynthesize. So if we know where the chlorophyll is in the water, we know where these, these tiny ocean plants are. The panel on the right, um, in a, a couple of the talks earlier, you, you heard about how we can use satellites to measure uh, sea level. We can use satellites to do all sorts of things <coughs> in measuring the ocean. And this particular satellite had a camera that is sensitive to chlorophyll. It can see chlorophyll. It can see how much chlorophyll there is. So the redder the colors, on this image of uh, the surface water here around the UK from the satellite, the redder the colour, the more chlorophyll there is uh, in the water. What I want you to see is all the way around here, there's this band of relatively high concentration of chlorophyll. If you superimposed the bathymetry, the 200 metre contour of where the edge of the continental shelf is, it sits right underneath that band of chlorophyll. And that band of chlorophyll has these things in it. They're really numerous. You can see them from satellite. If you, if you went down to Crosby Beach now and scooped up a mug full of seawater, this time of year, you probably have about a million of these tiny little plants uh, in, the, um, in the water. So this is the point where this band of chlorophyll is, is the point where that internal wave is breaking up and generating lots of, lots of turbulence. So this is... Some data from that instrument that you, show, that you saw in the video. So we're going, it's a profile of data from the sea surface down to not nearly 200 meters. So this is, this is close to the edge of the continental shelf. So the red line is showing the temperature. So you can see you've got warm temperature, nearly 18 degrees on the surface. Then it suddenly drops off and you've got that cold, denser water underneath. So that, that red line is showing you the layering of the, uh, of the ocean. 
The green line is showing you where the chlorophyll is. It's showing you where those, all, all those tiny planets are. And you can see that they're all up at the surface, because that's where there's lots of sunlight and where they can photosynthesize uh, and grow. These blue dots are the results of chemical analysis of water taken out of those grey uh, sample bottles. And this is showing you where the nitrate is, so the nitrogen fertilizer, effectively, that these microscopic plant cells need uh, in order to be able to grow. So up at the surface, what you can see, there's lots of light at the surface, but we have almost no nutrients, no nitrogen. So the phytoplankton, these tiny single cell plants, find it very difficult to grow up at the surface because they're limited by a lack of, uh, of nutrients. Down here, in the deeper water, lots and lots of nutrients, very high concentrations of nutrients, but it's dark. So the phytoplankton can't grow there. These microscopic plants can't grow there because it's just too dark. There's no light to photosynthesize. What this internal tidal wave does is generate some mixing here, which brings some of those deep nutrients up to the surface, and that's what, that's what allows these microscopic cells, microscopic uh, algae to, um, to grow. Now let's look at the other end of the food chain, looking at the fishing vessels. Uh, this is a really nice piece of data. It took ages to get this data, because um, uh, government agencies that have this kind of data hold onto it quite closely. What I was able to get over several years, so every uh, European Union fishing vessel above, I think it's 15 metres in length, has a little black box on the bridge which records its position and transits its position every hour when it's at sea. So I can get that data for every EU fishing vessel. In the, I was actually working with an Irish colleague, so I could get it for UK and for Irish waters. And so I have a record for every vessel, a record of time and position. So I can convert that into a record of the vessel's speed. And now I can say, OK, if that vessel is doing slower than about three or four knots, I'll assume that it's fishing. If it's doing more than about four or five knots, I'll assume it's in transit between places. So the left-hand panel here, so this is the Celtic Sea. You can just see uh, sort of Devon and Cornwall here, Brittany down here, uh, the southern part of Ireland uh, here. This is just for one of those fishing vessels. This particular one uh, came out of, uh, uh, out of Brittany. Where it's blue, that's where it's transiting between its, its home port and the fishing grounds. And these sort of reddish colours are where it stops to, stops to fish. The right-hand panel is, I've done the same analysis, for, but for about 1,200 different boats that are all fishing uh, in this area. And what you can see is that fishing boats don't fish everywhere. They go to particular places uh, in the ocean. Actually, we were doing some work. You can, you can identify what's special about the oceanography that means that these different places are, are important for fishing. So that bit up here, that's actually where the boats go to, cap, to capture the nephrops, the little scampi that you saw earlier. This is the edge of the continental shelf edge, where you get these breaking internal waves which bring nutrients up to the surface and increase the growth of the microscopic plants. And that is the most heavily fished part of the entire uh, local uh, shelf sea. So to wrap up that story, what's happening, this little panel here, um, is that every three years there's a, a huge um, international effort across several uh, European um, fisheries research institutes where they go out and sample the water all the way around the shelf uh, looking for mackerel eggs and mackerel larvae. So the bigger the grey dot here, the more mackerel larvae there are in the uh, water. And what you can see is that the mackerel larvae are largely found where this black line is, this 200 metre contour of the depth, <coughs> where this breaking internal tidal wave occurs, where the nutrients are mixed to the surface and fueling the growth of the microscopic, uh, microscopic plants. The fish that are producing these eggs and larvae, the mackerel stock, actually comes from somewhere way up here in the northern North Sea, the Norwegian Sea. Every year, they swim all the way down, following the edge of the continental shelf. They spawn here, and then they swim back again. Well, there are several reasons for that, but one of the reasons is when a mackerel larvae hatches, so this is a mackerel larvae here, these are all mackerel eggs surrounding it. When a mackerel larvae hatches, it's pretty small. It's about two millimetres in size. The first food that it requires are these microscopic single-celled plants. And so what we think is going on is that You've got a, a band of where these microscopic plants are growing, 
And the fish have evolved a behavior where they'll swim down to spawn in these places where effectively there's some food for the larvae, and that's where the larvae hatch. The larvae have a food source to start their life, and gradually they start drifting back up to the, uh, the grounds where the adults, the adults live. So there's a nice story there, I think, uh, in terms of um, a really quite fundamental part of the physics of how this layered ocean works and the tide moves backwards and forwards over the edge of the continental shelf, which drives mixing the nutrients up to the surface. Uh, you get the growth of these uh, plants, microscopic plants up on the surface. That provides the food for the fish larvae and that ultimately sustains, uh, sustains the fishery. So I hope what I've given you there is a couple of interesting ex examples about, well, first of all, why our tides are so big. Hopefully you understand now why our tides are so big. And a, and a really important consequence of that in terms of what life is like for anything living on the seabed in the Irish Sea. Uh, and also how the tide generates these internal tides, these tides, tidal waves underneath the sea surface, and how they can have actually quite an important consequence uh, for how, um, uh, how the biology and ultimately the fisheries of the region uh, work. So I'll finish there. If you're interested in any of this stuff, I, I, you, well, you just search for me at Liverpool University. You can find a web page, and I've got sort of bits and pieces of uh, information uh, on there, a couple of videos and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, thanks for thanks for listening. How do people decide whose fish it is? Sorry, I don't know. Good government is that. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if there's time for. Two, the two really good questions. So the first question on the Gulf Stream. So does the Gulf Stream um, have any influence on this? You often see, uh, usually exalted David Attenborough made a, made a comment about this, which really wound me up because it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it, people like that shouldn't be wrong. Um, you often hear the idea that the Gulf Stream bathes the UK in warm subtropical waters, and it's just, it's just not true. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is, actually, the Gulf Stream doesn't really make it this far across. Uh, to the Atlantic. A lot of the Gulf Stream is important because it's bringing warm water from the Gulf of Mexico up northwards past the US uh, continental shelf and it's supplying that warm salty water up into the Arctic as well. It's very difficult. You think of that, um, that step in the seabed as you cross the edge of the continental shelf. It's very difficult for currents in the deep ocean to cross that step. It's a really fundamental physical barrier to how those deep ocean currents can move. And so these deep ocean currents, like the Gulf Stream, can't cross into the shallow water. But the Gulf Stream is very important to us. If you look at our climate compared to the climate at a similar latitude, probably somewhere like the Bay of Fundy or in Canada, we have a really mild climate. Northwest Europe has a very mild climate. And the reason for that is that the Gulf Stream is bringing warm water northwards. All the weather systems that come across us cross the Gulf Stream first. So they get warmed up by the Gulf Stream before they cross over onto us. So, can I answer the second question? If I'm really quick. Um, yes. Okay, so the second question was about the, the sort of undersea volcanoes, essentially the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Does that affect the tides? Think back to that little uh, video I had of the tank experiment where I'm moving that backwards and forwards. So in, instead of that little uh, cylinder that I was moving being the continental shelf edge, think of it as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And you see exactly the same thing. I don't know, Chris, you might be yeah, talking I'll, I'll about this. So that is something we're working on at the moment, is that actually it has the same effect. And we're, we're starting to see, right up at the surface, two and a half kilometers above where all these volcanoes are, we can see some biological effects associated with the tide sloshing backwards and forwards over that ridge. So yeah, that's, that's a, well for me, that's a pretty hot topic, topic at the moment. Thanks.